Hey guys, welcome back to our review series on the Mazda R9 wheelbase and GS steering wheel. So yesterday, if you haven't seen that video, we took a deep dive into the hardware side of things. We pulled things apart, had a look at build quality and discussed all those things. Today, it's all about the software calibration and driving experience. So let's just jump straight into it. Okay, so all plugged in and up and running on our PC now. Just one simple software package and executable file to download off the Mozza Racing website. And that installs the Mozza Pit House software, which we're gonna look at now, as well as all the drivers and the firmware update process is all done through this software as well. So there isn't multiple packages you need to download. Everything is included in the one package, which is very nice. Now, importantly, there is also a mobile app which you can download and that connects to your wheelbase wirelessly via Bluetooth. And you'll remember earlier in the video, we saw the little Bluetooth transceiver sitting on the back of the unit. So there's one in the front which connects to your wheel. The one in the back is what's responsible for communicating with the app. That's available for iPhone and Android and it allows access to most of the same adjustments and settings that we're gonna be looking at through the Pit House software here, but it gives you a really convenient way of making adjustments on the fly without the need to alt tab across and go into the software. Now remember, of course, we don't have access to a tuning menu via the wheel like we have the Fnatic ecosystem and that is one of the strengths of the Fnatic ecosystem by comparison to this, but we'll reflect on all that sort of stuff more when we get into our conclusions a little bit later on. So we can't make any adjustments to our settings from the wheel itself, but we do have the ability to make those changes from a tablet or just your phone if you happen to have that handy. So very nice to see that inclusion, but let's run through the Pit House software in its entirety now. So this is the main home screen. Gives you a quick rundown on the peripherals that are connected. You can see here we've got our GS wheel and our R9 base. And the pedals are grayed out because you guessed that we don't have any of their pedals connected to our system. Now we've got tabs down the left hand side here for each of our individual peripherals. So we've got the wheel base and all the settings that pertain to that. We've got the wheel, we've got pedals, we've got the dash. Then we've got a firmware update tab here that shows the current firmware version for all the peripherals which are connected to the system and also gives you a convenient way of upgrading all of your firmware based on the latest version available to in one click, which is really nice and convenient. Uh, and we can also click on version checking here and that's gonna check to make sure based off right now, whether you actually have the latest version installed. So all very nicely put together, very convenient there. One more tab as well. This allows you to do things like changing language, DPI scaling, dark and light themes. There's a recovery and reset tab here as well, which hopefully nobody's ever gonna need, but that gives you a few different options here for various different firmware recoveries. Deleting dodgy calibrations, erasing firmware, and things like that. And then we've also got an experimental function here as well for mucking around with different firmware versions. But again, not something that I would imagine most people would want to play around with. So in my opinion, at least a very clean and well-presented piece of software, quite similar in fact to the uh, Acer Tech SimSport software that we looked at recently with the Forte pedals. So you can see as they add more additional peripherals, I would imagine they'd update this same software package. So you don't have to download separate software for each Mozza Sim Racing product, which is great. Keeps things nice and simple and keeps the uh, keeps the whole ecosystem nicely integrated together. Now on the right hand side here as well, we also have a game launcher here. So that detects the games that you have installed. Now it also lists games that you don't have installed in the list as well. And that was one of the things that I called out when we looked at the earlier versions of the Pit House software. It would be nice for it to hide games that you don't have installed because they're not relevant and then uh, only show the ones that you do have installed, but it is what it is. Now, one of the things that you will find is that there's a little bit of configuration necessary for some games to work with this wheelbase. So it doesn't integrate quite as seamlessly as the Fnatic ecosystem does, for example. So you can see under some games, we've got a launch button as well as a config button. If we hit that config button, some of the games will automatically configure. Some of them will bring up a dialog box that tells you some of the changes that you need to make. So say Dirt Rally 2, for example, there were a couple of tweaks we had to make in a INI file to make that work, but it does pop up and it explains all the things that you need to do to make that work. So it's not too challenging, but again, it's just an inconvenience compared to some ecosystems which are out there but you don't need to launch your games from here for them to work with the wheelbase. You can't just launch them from Steam or your desktop or start menu. So let's run through now the configuration and adjustments which are available here. So we can see for the wheel, we've got a center button. So obviously that is gonna allow us to calibrate our wheel center. And that's as simple as just getting the wheel aligned correctly, hitting the center button. And it is as simple as that. You can see if I were to go there and then make it broken, we can 
set it to center again. Now underneath the center button here, we have an adjustment for maximum steering angle. You'll also notice an adjustment here for force feedback intensity. So this is like a master control or a master gain control, which adjusts the overall strength of the wheelbase. So a couple of quick adjustments there for things that you might be likely to want to change on the fly without having to go into all the more granular settings and details, which we'll look at in just a minute. So the maximum steering angle is basically just controlling how much the wheelbase turns before it hits its mechanical bump stop. Now, the bump stop inside a direct drive wheelbase is software based. So if we were to increase that to say 900 or 2000 even, you can see now if we're driving a truck sim, we can rotate that through a full 2000 degrees before we actually hit that bump stop. And that is because the direct drive wheelbase doesn't have any linked parts within its internals. So it's able to rotate infinitely before it hits those bump stops. So just to rotate around the other way again now, and you'll see when we hit that bump stop eventually, it kind of has a, it has a nice mechanical feel to it. You can pull it past that if you want to, but it almost feels like it's spring loaded there. So when we pull it like that, it'll bounce back to where that bump stop sits. So great to see that they do have provision to go all the way up to 2000 degrees for people that are wanting to use something like this for a truck sim. So most sim racers will spend most of their time between 900 and 360 degrees. And you can see now with 360 degrees clicked, the wheel now hits that bump stop at, you guessed it, 180 degrees in each direction as we would expect. And that is all nice and simple. So again, we can make these same adjustments within the pit house software on our mobile device as well. So as I mentioned before, we've got our game force feedback intensity adjustment here. Again, we've got a slider as well as a percentage window where you can just type in a value. I'm actually gonna set this to 100% for now. And then if we click on the little more buttons above each one, it's gonna jump us straight to the corresponding tabs down the left-hand side. So let's hit more on the R9 base now, you can see that's now jumped across. And now we have three tabs, one for basic settings, one for advanced settings, and one for a force feedback equalizer. So starting off with the basic settings here, we've got some presets for a variety of different driving styles. So that gives you a nice little starting point there, which you can then fine tune all of these adjustments to your personal preference. So if we click on drift, for example, you can see the maximum speed of the steering wheel increases to 100%. If we go back to GT, it should go a lot lower. And we can also save and import settings here as well. That just brings up a standard Windows dialog box to save a JSON file. So if you wanna set up profiles for different sims or different cars, you can do so. You can also send them to your mates to check out as well. Now, another thing you'll notice as well is we have a handy little tooltip icon next to each of these settings, which explains in plain English exactly what the setting does. So we'll run through those for you so you get a good sense of all the adjustments which we have available in the software. So starting off with maximum limit and steering angle, that's exactly the same adjustment that we saw just before on the homepage down here. But you'll notice now we also have a little toggle switch to switch between synchronous and asynchronous mode. So you'll notice maximum limit and steering angle are actually two different things which are usually combined but can be used separately. So the maximum limit determines the maximum amount that the wheel is able to physically turn before you hit that bump stop. But some games don't like you messing with the steering angle. Now the steering angle is the value that's actually outputted by the wheelbase as it's interpreted by the game. So you can imagine if the game is expecting say 900 degrees, but we actually set the wheelbase to 540 degrees, what's gonna happen is the steering is gonna feel super, super sensitive because a small amount of movement here is gonna relate to a large amount of movement inside the game. So what this allows us to do is create an offset here. So say for example, the game wants to see 900 degrees, so we'll type 900, but you actually want to feel that bump stop in the wheel at say 360 degrees, what we can do is we can create exactly that scenario. So now the game is gonna be happy because it's seeing the values that it wants to see to not make the steering overly sensitive, but we still get the benefit of that mechanical feeling bump stop from the motor at the level of degrees that we want it set to. So I don't know of too many sim titles these days that require this, but it is a good thing to see that they've included that. They've obviously, you know, they spent a lot of time thinking about some of the various different scenarios which might play out for various different people. But we're gonna set that back to synchronous for now. I'm gonna jump it back to 540 degrees. So road sensitivity here, it says the road sensitivity ranges from zero to 10. The greater the value, the stronger the road effect feel. The smaller the value, the softer the road feels. So that's gonna be communicating things like road textures, ripple strips, dirt and gravel, all those things. And we have a range here from zero to 10 with a default setting of nine. 
So gain force feedback intensity, this acts like an amplifier or multiplier on top of the value that you set inside your game. So most games have an adjustment for force feedback strength within the game itself, and then this adds on top of that. So what you generally wanna do, this is what I recommend at least, set the game so you're getting as much output as possible without clipping, and then you can adjust your force feedback intensity here to you know kind of fine tune to what you like to feel through the wheel itself. So that's what that's aiming to do. And if we hover over the tooltip here, it says the integral force feedback or the total force feedback consists of game force feedback or the value coming out of the game plus the motor force feedback, which is the value that we're setting here. So maximum speed of the steering wheel. This one says the higher the value is, the faster the steering wheel returns to the wheel during travel. I assume that means to the center during travel. High return speed is more suitable for drifting, while low reversing speed can make the steering more natural, more stable, and more accurate. At the same time, low return speed can ensure the safety of racing drivers. So obviously if you're drifting, you want the wheel to very quickly react to what's going on with the wheels inside the game. Whereas for normal racing, generally you're dealing with smaller movements, so you're able to mechanically move the wheels back to center rather than having to rely on the wheels slipping back to center as you would with drifting. Now we can actually illustrate this if we move our mechanical back to center strength up to 100%. So you can see at the moment, wherever I leave the wheel, that is just gonna sit there because we don't have any back to center strength. Now most games actually have their own inbuilt back to center, so you don't need to add this in. But just for the purpose of illustration here, if we were to crank this up to 100 and crank that down to the lowest setting, you'll see if I wind that around, it should rotate back to center quite slowly. If I crank that up to 100%, what we should see is the wheel return to center a lot faster. So let's let go, I'm gonna keep my hands well clear. Yeah, you can see that went much faster. Let's just illustrate that once more, go back down to 10. You can see that actually spent around quite a lot slower. So essentially the purpose of the back to center adjustment here is in the absence of raw telemetry data coming out of the sim, which actually tells the wheel to return back to center. If you're playing a game that doesn't have any force feedback, it's gonna give you that sensation of the steering wheel trying to return to the middle like it does in real life. So then we have mechanical dampening. This has got a pretty big tooltip here. So this is basically like a smoothing adjustment. It should hopefully allow us to fine tune out any robotic feeling that we might get in the wheel, but obviously at the expense of making things feel overall more dampened. So it'll be interesting to fiddle around with that and fine tune it a little bit later on. So that is all of our basic settings. Let's now click across to advanced settings. So reversal game force feedback. That's an interesting one. Turn this on when some games require the game force feedback to reversal. So I'm guessing if the uh, if the car's trying to force you to go right when you go left or something like that. I've never experienced that happening, but again, it's good that they have the option there if you do have a problem. Maximum output torque limit. So say for example, you've got young kids that are using the base and you don't want them to be at risk of injuring their hands, which you can do with nine Newton meters. It's not a small amount of force. Then uh, you can crank this down to limit the maximum amount of force feedback that you're ever gonna feel. Now, another scenario where you might wanna use this is say for example, you're wanting to feel more detail in road textures and things like that, but then when you crash, you don't want the wheel to feel overly strong. What you can do is you can crank up your force feedback so you're getting all of that extra detail, all that extra strength in the finer details, but then when you crash, it's not gonna go completely nuts. So if we crank this down, then basically what that's saying is limit the maximum amount of torque that the wheelbase is ever gonna output under you know worst case scenario, so crashing for example, but it's not gonna scale down all the other effects as well. It's just putting a hard cap there at the maximum as opposed to say for example, cranking down the overall force feedback intensity to limit the maximum amount of force feedback you're feeling. That's obviously going to reduce everything, I guess, in proportion to each other, if that makes sense. So back to advanced settings again here, hand off protection. So pretty simple stuff, really. It just means if you do take your hands off the wheel and it begins to oscillate, then uh, it's not gonna go beyond a certain point before it just kind of stops because it realizes that nobody's holding onto the wheel. Base status indicator, enable or disable the blue status light on the front of the base. I'm really glad that they've added that now because that was one of the nitpicks that I had about the, uh, the R16. It's got this little light in the front here, which I can't actually see when I have the GS wheel installed, but some of the other wheels you can see it. So switch that off. And now it's not shining in my face anymore, which is very nice. So that's great that they've added that in. I wasn't sure whether it was actually able to be controlled through firmware, but obviously it is, which is good. So we've then got natural inertia and mechanical friction. Both of those kind of add the sensation of weight into the steering. So with natural inertia, it's a little bit hard to show on camera, but if I switch off hand protection, it might work for me. Let's crank that all the way up. Now, 
if I turn the wheel and then let go, now it does kind of stop dead in its tracks. But what I'm feeling through the wheel is as I turn it, you kind of get the sense of weight. So it's like kind of, you know, reefing at something, getting it moving. And then as you sort of try to stop your hands, you feel the inertia of the steering behind it kind of trying to force you to keep moving. So a little bit different from friction in that sense. Whereas if I increase the friction, that's basically just adjusting the constant force that I'm feeling. Let's set that back to default again for now. I'm gonna leave that hand protection on too. Speed dependent dampening. So pretty much exactly what it says. Scales the amount of dampening relative to the speed that the vehicle is traveling inside the game. And then we also have an adjustment here for the start point of that dampening as well. So you can adjust that to be whatever speed that you want for your personal preference. So then we have a force feedback equalizer as well. And this is really interesting. So this will be familiar to those of you who might be into audio gear. On the left hand side here, our Y axis, that is our gain control and then our x-axis is our frequency control. Now we don't have the ability to adjust Q here or the width of each frequency band which we're adjusting, but what we can do is adjust each frequency range in terms of gain. And up the top here, we can see a reference which tells us what that frequency band is responsible for communicating. So operating wheel, body bumps, 80 kilometers riding on curb and so forth all the way through. So what we can do is fine tune at a relatively granular level the amount of gain for each of these frequency ranges. And that's gonna allow us to really kind of fine tune those effects to get the exact sort of sensation that we're wanting out of the wheel. So not something that I've personally seen from any other wheel-based brand to date, and definitely something that was useful on the R16 when we tested that, and I'm sure it will be useful here as well. So that is everything in terms of force feedback controls. What I'll do is start off driving with default settings. I'll do some fine tuning and let you know where we landed in terms of settings. So let's run through the settings for the GS wheel. Now, most of these are pretty similar on the RS wheel that we tested previously with the R16 as well, but obviously it will depend on which wheel you have connected to the base. And obviously as their ecosystem expands, some of this might change as well. So starting off with the function of the analog clutch paddles, we have three different modes here, axis combine, axis split and button. Now in axis combine mode, we also have an adjustment here for the joint point as they're calling it, but this is really just the bite point. Now, obviously this will depend on the car that you're driving, but you wanna set this to be so that the clutch is engaging when you release one paddle, just at the exact right bite point that you want for the vehicle that you're driving, and then you can release the second paddle to get underway. And that works very well, obviously, depending on the types of car that you're driving, you may not need it, but it's definitely a valuable feature to have. You also have the option of an axis split mode. So this basically just allows you to map an analog axis for each of the paddles. So you could set it for throttle and brake, handbrake and clutch, something like that if you wanted to. Really just depends again on your personal preference. So if you have a disability or you're not able to use pedals for some reason, then you can use a throttle and brake on the wheel itself, which is very handy. And then we also have the option of mapping these as buttons as well. So if you need two additional functions inside your game, you can do that too. But we're gonna leave it on axis combined dual clutch mode for now. Band knob mode. So the five dials that we have here on the front have two different modes available, button and knob mode. So what this is allowing you to do is change between a multi-position switch mode for these buttons or a rotary encoder. So just to explain the difference in button mode here, you can see we actually get a number flash up for each position on the switch. Now, if I put it in position number 10, as far as the software is concerned, and then I take the wheel off, flip it back to number one, and then pop the wheel back on again. What we should see here is, you can see it's detected the position that the switch is in again. So what that means in the real world is that the physical position of the switch will always relate to the same setting inside your sim. So if you're setting engine map one, you're always going to have engine map one in the position for map one, regardless of whether you've taken the wheel off or moved the position of the switch when you booted up the game and so forth. So by contrast, if we switch it into knob mode, every time we turn the dial, it's just sending a pulse in either direction, left or right, and it has no reference point. So it doesn't know what its last state was. So some SIM titles don't have multi-position switch compatibility, so they don't understand that, uh, that type of signal. So it's great that we are able to choose between the two different modes here, because it means it's gonna work with everything. Obviously, multi-position switch mode is preferable where it's compatible, but it may not be compatible in some cases. So just to give you an example of this one, if I do the same thing, if I set it in switch position number one now, you can see there it's set in the center. And then if I go to the right, position four, but now if it disappears, when I go again, it's starting from the middle again. So it doesn't remember its last state there. So that's a good way to 
visually see what's going on. So again, if I leave it, you could see it was over to the left. And now if I turn it again, it's starting at the center again. So that is the difference between band knob mode. So then stick mode, that is an adjustment for the two sticks that we have for our thumbs. Now, it's a little bit strange because these are analog hat switches in that they move around freely like that. They don't click in each position. But the way these are actually implemented in the software appears to be digital. So when we're in button mode, both of these sticks are detected as button presses. So they actually show up as a physical button being pushed inside the software. If we change it to D-pad mode, then it's detected as a digital D-pad movement inside the game, but it doesn't appear to be analog in any sense. So if we try to have it as a look around thing and it goes gradually as you move the stick, that doesn't work. It is just purely a left is left, right is right, up is up and down is down, rather than being a gradual movement. Now, I'm a little bit confused by that because they are analog switches in terms of the physical hardware. So maybe we'll see that uh, implementation changed over time or something. But as it stands right now, at least, at the time that we're making this review, it does appear to be digital, regardless of which mode you have it in. It's just purely down to compatibility and whether it's detected as a button or a D-pad. So that is that. And then engine RPM indicator switch mode. So we have RPM indicator, which goes up and down as we rev our engine in the game, as you can see there. And then we have off, which obviously is off, and then on, which appears to just be the light on at all times with no other adjustments available. So you can see here in on and off mode, all these other options are grayed out. If we go to RPM indicator mode, then these switch on. So in RPM indicator mode, we also have some more configuration that we can do here. So mode one, in this mode, the color of each light that comes on is not related to the other lights. And then mode two, in this mode, only one color is displayed at a time when the nth light comes on, the first N minus one change to the color of the nth light. So let's have a look at that. Mode one, as we rev our engine, you can see each individual segment lights up like so. And then if we go to mode two, you can see now it stays the one color until the entire bar changes. So as we rev it up, green, red, and then pink. I think that's pink, I'm colorblind, so don't judge me. <laughs> but yeah, you can see the differences there. So again, mode one, you've got a multicolor strip and then mode two, the entire strip changes color as you get higher up in the sequence. We'll back it off a little bit so you can see, there you go. And then we have a few different options here for configuring the timing of the lights coming on as well. So lead, normal, late, or custom. And in custom, obviously you can then adjust the sliders so that the RPMs will trigger matching exactly what you have in the car that you're driving. So obviously different cars have different RPM ranges, so you can adjust this to suit whatever car it is that you're driving. You can also configure the colors too. So say for example, you wanna start off with red for some reason, you just drag red to the segment that you want and that will make the change on the wheel. So very simple there. And then we also have a brightness adjustment here for the LEDs across the entire wheel too. Now, one thing that I did notice, if you set a value less than 100%, you can see a slight pulsing in all of the LEDs across the entire wheel. I don't know whether it's maybe a slight voltage variance with the inductive coupling system or something like that, but when we're set at 100% brightness, it's not an issue. It seems to be pretty static, but yeah, anything lower than that. And we do get a very slight pulsing effect going on. I don't think it's gonna bother anybody, but it is there. So obviously we need to point it out to you guys. So that is a run through the Moza Pithouse software. Let's jump into our driving impressions now. So let's run through first impressions of the R9 wheelbase and GS and RS rim too. I'm gonna to chuck the RS rim on the base as well, just give you a couple of impressions of that as well, because I know that's an option that some people will be looking at with the R9 base. So first things first, I absolutely love the quick release that we see used on the Mozza Sim Racing gear. So same same style quick release as we have on the Sim Magic stuff as well. It's great on those and it's great on these too. So it's an NRG style quick release, exactly the same as what you'll find on a lot of real life race cars, obviously with the addition of these little floating pins inside as we saw before to create the electrical connection between the base and the wheel and then obviously the communication is done with the Bluetooth chip, which we saw before as well. So to install it, we literally just align this so that our arrows are pointing to the right, line our wheel up as well, and push it on, clicks on, boots up, and it's got a really nice startup sequence there as well, you can see. 
And once the wheel is on, it's as simple as that. Everything just works. You don't need to reboot software or anything like that. So you can hot swap between wheels while you're in the pits if you wish to do so. And everything is all good to go. Now, in terms of flex on the wheelbase, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of flex in the quick release itself. I can just slightly feel a bit of a ticking sensation just when the wheel rocks from side to side. It's absolutely minimal though. You really do have to pay attention to it to notice that it's there at all. And it's definitely way better than what you get with the Fnatic QR1 style quick release. They're yet to release their QR2 and I'm pretty confident that will change things, although it will come at a price of course. But as it stands right now, the Moza and Sim Magic quick releases are way better, in my opinion at least, than the uh, than the Fnatic ones are. So that is definitely a point to consider because that is something that you will appreciate every time you get in a car and drive it. Now, if I pop the RS wheel on just quickly as well, just to show you exactly how easy this is. So again, just pops on. There we go. That's in, and let it boot up. And yeah, exactly the same little slight ticking sensation I get in the quick release there as it moves around. But I mean, look, there's definitely not excessive play or anything like that in that quick release. It's nice and solid and yeah, very, very happy with it. You can see the RS wheel does have a bit of flex in the rim itself. It's actually twisting on the spokes here along this face. But look, in terms of shaft play on the, on the motor itself or anything like that, there is a little tiny bit. I can see when I pull up and down on the rim, there's a tiny bit of flex in the cockpit, minimal, but you can actually see the shaft just there moving very slightly relative to the housing. But again, that's not gonna be something that you'd notice when driving, at least I don't think. We'll comment on it if we do notice it, of course, but it's something that is there. Again, not as much movement as we get with the CSL DD by comparison though. So yeah, it's fine. So I'm gonna pop this one off again. So to release it, all you do is literally just squeeze the quick release and the whole wheel just pops off like so. Very, very simple to do. And we'll pop the GS wheel back on. Click, there we go, we're on. I love that boot up sequence. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about impressions of the wheel and then we'll get in and do some driving. So no twist at all to speak of in this room. I was a little bit concerned given that it is a plastic back here, although we do have the five millimeter thick carbon. I thought it might have a little bit of flex or twist in it. Definitely nothing that's gonna bother anybody there. There's no twist in the grips. The Alcantara feels nice as well. Pretty much exactly the same material. In fact, I think it is the exact same material that's used on the Fnatic rims. Looks, there's a couple of interesting similarities there. So that's one of them, definitely very similar there. But as we commented earlier on in the video, the buttons do have a good feel to them. They don't quite have the same, I guess, instantaneous feel to them that a lot of other buttons do in the sim racing space, but they do have a nice mechanical click to them. They feel intentional when you push them down. And you know, really it's a subjective thing. Some people are gonna prefer certain button styles over others. One thing I did notice here, as we saw before again, but just to reiterate, a couple of the buttons are a little bit off center. Some of the ones that are labeled, you can see the writing's a little bit skew if, particularly the whip button and the end button there. So just little tiny attention to detail, things like that may bother some people. Obviously, I don't imagine every single wheel is gonna be exactly the same as this one, but it is what it is. I love the anodized caps on the rotary encoder slash multi-position switches though. They feel really nice, cold to the touch, which is cool. And again, if you compare that to the equivalent Fnatic formula style wheel, that actually has plastic caps on those switches. And then another thing that stands out now we're sitting here in the rig as well is just how nice the thumb encoders feel. They've got really nice solid clearly defined detents for each position. And they feel a lot more intentional for each click than the Fnatic V2 wheel. In fact, I've got the Fnatic V2 wheel here. So let's actually have a look at that. You can see that almost, not quite, but it almost free spins. You can feel a very, very, very slight click between each movement. But you can imagine when you're trying to move that with, particularly with gloves on when you're driving, it's very hard to feel where one click is. Now, when you're driving, you can actually kind of do a one flick equals one move versus one click equals one move. So what I generally do is if I'm changing engine maps, I just go flick, 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 and that would change three times. But it can be a little bit touch and go, and it does depend on the sim that you're driving. But yeah, I definitely would have to say I prefer the thumb encoders that we have here on the Mozzle wheel. It is a subjective thing, but I think objectively they are better quality than what we have on the Fnatic wheel. And another thing you'll notice as well is that these are actually a push button too. So you can map a function to pushing those in. I don't know how useful that's likely to be. I might be concerned about uh, accidentally bumping it when driving, I think, but obviously you're not gonna be assigning it to anything that is mission critical. But yeah, 
they are mappable, so there's that as well. But yeah, in terms of form factor, ergonomics, and overall functionality, very happy with the wheel. I think they've done a really good job. The only real nitpicks I have are just really subjective cosmetic things. Like I'm not a big fan of some of the intricacies in the design here. I think that looks a little bit cheap and toy-like, but again, some people might like that. So that's just a personal preference thing. Okay, so we're in the Porsche 911 Cup car, the 992 here at Imola. This is a track and car combination I love to use to test hardware because the car's rear engine, it moves around a lot. It's quite tail happy, no ABS either. So you really do need to get a good sense of what the car's doing to be able to drive it quickly and consistently. So we'll see how we go today. Now, the first thing that I always like to do when I'm testing out a new wheelbase is kind of just get a feel for how things feel when you've got the force feedback engaged but you're not actually moving. Once you start driving, you've got a lot of information coming at you and it's hard to sort of pay attention to small, finite details. So immediately as I turn the wheel from side to side, there's a tiny, 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 and I mean tiny, little bit of cogging or torque ripple effect there. So you feel a slight graininess, but it is very, very, very slight. And I don't think it's gonna be something that I notice when driving. I'd say it's probably the same, if not maybe even a little tiny bit less than the CSL DD and the GT DD Pro. Definitely less than you get with the DD2 or DD1 and a lot, lot, lot less than you get with the SimMagic M10, for example. But it is a little bit more than you get with the SimMagic Alpha or the SimiCube range. So just for comparison, I haven't tested an Alpha Mini but I have tested an Alpha and that is absolutely smooth. VRS Direct Force Pro as well is completely smooth. So this sits between those, but I'd say it's, it's very, very close in terms of the torque ripple feeling that you get with the CSL DD. There'd be very little in it. Now, as I rotate the steering wheel around and feel the weight of the car kind of lifting up due to the camber and caster of the wheels, you do get a good sensation of the weight of the car through the steering as well. That feels really nice. And yeah, it feels quite good and authentic. Now, one thing I did notice here, if you have a look at the little, uh, the little control panel down there where it shows the clutch input, as I move those clutches in and out, you can see it's very jerky and jolty and quite laggy. So I don't know quite what the deal is with that. It definitely seems to be some sort of an issue. I did try it with the RS wheel as well and it did do the same thing. So I'm guessing there's some sort of a firmware issue with the R9 base. I'm sure it's something that'll be able to be fixed, but it, it could be. It, given that this is the only analog, uh, the only analog signal that's coming through that Bluetooth um, interface, it could be that there's some sort of an issue with the uh, with the polling rate or something like that. But anyway, we'll see. But I just, it's just something I noticed, so I thought it was important to mention it. But we'll drive out here. It doesn't seem to affect the operation of the clutch, but yeah, I don't know. It's it is what it is though. Let's. Yeah, it did feel a little bit glitchy there. So definitely something going on with that clutch. We'll, um, we'll have to revisit that. But let's drive out here. Now I am running the default wheelbase settings at the moment. I did just quickly configure iRacing to expect a nine Newton meter wheelbase. But other than that, haven't changed anything else. We just want to check and make sure that we're not getting any clipping in our force feedback as well. We shouldn't be. Bit of a lock up there. Just get a sense of what's going on. No, I'm not getting any clipping, so that's all good. All right, let's pick up the pace a little bit. So it does, it's feeling a little bit vague at the moment, but that, again, that's just with the default settings. but very, very smooth overall in, in terms of the way I'm feeling the weight of the car moving around. I think the effects maybe feel a touch robotic compared to the Fnatic base, the CSL DD, the GT DD Pro. Whoa, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a bit of a mistake. Let me just make a couple of quick adjustments and um, yeah, we'll come back. So spent quite a bit of time here just going through everything fine tuning and there is, as we saw before, a lot of things that you can change here, particularly on the force feedback equalizer to really dial things in. So I wanted to quickly run you through the changes that I made, why I made them and the impact that they had uh, for each thing. So obviously we didn't need to change our steering angle. That doesn't impact how the force feedback feels. It's just purely how much you have to rotate the wheel. Uh, road sensitivity, I did actually, I mucked around between seven and 10. 
I found bringing it up to 10 just did, as you would expect, bring out a little bit more detail in the road. Now, I was struggling a little bit with a bit of a robotic feeling in road textures, particularly just little bumps in the road. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when we test out some of the other sims later on. One of the things that we always try to do as much as we can here is test wheelbases with multiple different sims to see whether the, whether the experience is consistent across them. But for iRacing, at least where we are now, uh, cranking that up to 10 did start to give me a bit more of a robotic feeling. What I found is when I cranked up the gain on some of these higher frequencies in the force feedback equalizer, that seemed to sort of mitigate that issue and bring in a little bit more, I guess, granular detail and drown out some of that robotic feeling that we had before. Now, it does still feel a little bit robotic compared to the, uh, the CSL DD and GTDD Pro, I will admit, but I think I've managed to get it very, very close. Now, game force feedback intensity, I left that at 100. We've got our game output setting just below the point of clipping, and you'll see when we go for a drive in just a minute, the, uh, the gauge is just below clipping, so there's no issues there. Maximum speed of steering wheel. I sped that up a little bit more than I expected I would need to, just to sort of get a more snappy response in the wheel. Mechanical back to center strength, we don't need that because iRacing centers the wheel by itself. Anyway, mechanical dampening, again, this one surprised me a little bit. Ended up landing on 60 here. I thought I might actually need to run it lower to get the detail in the road textures, but again, cranking up the gain on those other effects under the force feedback equalizer and having the road sensitivity set to 10 seemed to feel okay with a dampening level a little bit higher. And that filtered out a little bit of that notchiness once again, made it feel a little bit smoother and a little bit more lifelike up, particularly when it came to things like running up on curbs and sort of getting the sensation of the car moving around. So let's click across to advanced settings now. Uh, maximum torque output left that at 100. I feel like the nine newton meters here is uh, is you know fine for me. I'm used to driving it around sort of 12 to 15 newton meters on my Simi Cube 2 Ultimate, so um, yeah, 100% is fine for me there. But we'll talk about strength in our conclusions a little bit later on. Natural inertia and mechanical friction. Spent quite a bit of time playing around with those. Did find anything over about 15% for the mechanical friction, 150% for natural inertia. Started to make the wheel feel you know, artificially heavy rather than, you know, feeling a genuine sense of weight in the in the steering rack of a, of a car in the real world. So that was where I landed there. Speed dependent dampening. Again, that's actually quite a defined uh, characteristic that you feel when you're driving. You really do sort of feel the, the wheel get a little bit heavier as you're going faster, which again gives you quite a nice authentic feeling. So 59% and 90 kilometers an hour is where I landed there. And then force feedback effect equalizer. Honestly, I was expecting that this might be a bit of a gimmick. I did find it to be relatively useful with the R16 wheelbase when we tested that a number of months ago, but I spent quite a bit of time in here fine tuning things. And I did find, as I was referencing before, cranking up the gain on some of these higher frequencies just brought out that little bit more detail and I guess more granular detail in what we were doing rather than having the sort of more robotic feeling in road textures, running up on ripple strips and things like that. So that's where we landed with settings. Let's jump back into the sim now, do a couple of laps, sort of explain through exactly what I'm feeling, the kind of characteristics that are going on, and then we'll give a couple of other sims a go as well. All right, so let's get underway here. Now I'm not expecting magical lap times. I am running on a relatively unfamiliar rig here. So my sense of speed is a little bit different from what it would normally be, but I can still get a good sense of what's going on. Now, one thing that generally tends to lack a little bit in iRacing is just a general road texture feel. It tends to feel a little bit vague compared to the likes of, say, ACC, for example. And I think part of that is just down to the lower force feedback uh, frequency that we have in iRacing compared to ACC. That runs at 400 hertz now. So you get a little bit more granular detail there anyway. But you'll notice the force feedback gauge, that a little F underneath the 84 frames per second on the bottom left of the screen there. That shouldn't be clipping at any point. So we'll get turned in here. And yeah, as we bump over those ripple strips, it's getting close to the maximum, which is what we want, but not, not quite clipping. So that's all good. Now I'm gonna run over a couple of sausages and things intentionally here as we go around as well, just to sort of explain. But I guess the thing that's standing out to me is overall how smooth the wheelbase does feel, particularly just in transition. I'm not getting any sense of notchiness in the center like we get with some wheelbases. That was one of the issues that we had with the earlier Sim Magic wheelbases, in particular the M10. 
It was quite a big notch in the center. We struggled with it quite a bit with the VRS Direct Force Pro as well until we managed to dial it out with some settings. But again, there, it was a bit notchy at first, but with the combination of the settings that we have now, it's nice and smooth. The transition across past the center line is very smooth. So that's all good. When we run up over the ripple strips there, I get a good sense of what's going on with the car. I can feel the suspension moving around. I feel the back end sort of twitching on me there too. I'm gonna intentionally get a little bit of sh out of shape just around this downhill braking zone. I'm gonna brake a little bit late. Just let the car understeer a bit there. Just kind of hook it around. Yeah, so there you go. As the car rotates, the steering comes around quite nicely. And look, honestly guys, I'm feeling all the things that I need to feel here. I mean, it's it's very, very, very close to the experience with the CSL DD, I would say. A little bit less detail going on, but very, very, very close. I'm struggling to get back on the track here. <laughs> so we'll head out again quickly now on fresh tires. Kind of cooked those other tires. And let's just turn a couple of quick laps here, or quicker laps and just get more of a sense of what the car feels like closer to the limit. So again, the car bounced up like that. You can see how the car was bouncing up over those sausages and I got that sensation through the steering there. So I felt the steering get light and then get heavy again when I landed. Now we are still on cold tires here, so we're gonna be a little bit careful. Again, good sensation up on the ripple strip there. Not a whole lot of sensation when I ran out onto the Astro there, but that tends to lack in iRacing anyway. Break at the 50. Yeah, I'm really happy with how this has landed. It's it's feeling really good. You're probably noticing how loud the shifters are. I'm gonna install the little rubber pads which we looked at earlier in the back of those shifters in a moment and see what kind of an impact that has. But definitely one thing I'm not super happy about. I mean, a lot of high-end shifters are loud, but these ones are particularly loud kind of echoes through the frame a little bit. All right, so faster lap now. To back off the throttle a little there. We're getting a really good sense of balance. A little wide. <laughs> but little little road textures going on there too. I can feel the back end getting light there. I had to back out of the throttle a little bit. Got the sensation through the wheel. My braking is definitely leaving something to be desired, but it's nothing to do with the wheel. But no, I guess the thing that's standing out to me is just the overall smoothness. I thought, I mean, again, when you, when you consider where we were a couple of years ago with more entry-level direct drive wheelbases like the Simmagic M10 and just how grainy that felt, it really is amazing how far we've come in the last couple of years with products like the CSL DD and now this as well. Very, very impressed, I've got to say.
So that's a wrap on today's video. We're gonna come back tomorrow with part three where we'll be discussing our thoughts on the hardware, the software, the driving experience, the comparison with other competitors on the market, and just wrapping everything up with our conclusions in general. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you're subbed so you don't miss out on it. Thanks for watching today's video, guys. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.